Marion, we are trying to find one thing that can make a difference, not to the exclusion of other things, but one thing that we can measure, one thing that we can, when we meet again in a year's time, we can say, you know, we did that, we got somewhere, because otherwise it's just talking, talking, talking. Is that realistic in your view? And, and should we look to the European Parliament to do anything other than just help us from the sidelines? Well, first of all, I'm delighted to be here. Apologies, I couldn't make it any sooner. And of course, I'm even slightly late for this part of it. Uh, unfortunately, it's one of those days. However, to try to answer your question, and I listened carefully to what my colleagues said, because I haven't heard the deliberations before this, and I'm trying to integrate to some extent what, what you have said in, into my response. I, I'd start with my colleague here. You talked about the economics of it. And you specifically said that because of the cuts in member states, etc., that um, healthcare systems are not quite falling apart, but in some member states they are, in others they are stretched beyond belief. And one thing came straight to my mind. We have something called the European Semester, where the European Commission looks at the budgets of member states and assesses those budgets and spending targets, etc. And one of the areas they are now going to look at is healthcare, because the Parliament, for example, along with others, but the Parliament in particular, pushed very hard that it wouldn't be just economic indicators, so to be fair to the European Commission, that there would be social indicators. So maybe there's a possibility there of, of finding something in that. I mean, I'm trying to be practical here to talk about what can be done now or in the near future. That's not going to get more money into the pot. There is only so much money to go around. But it might help ensure that that sector gets a little bit larger slice of the cake. Um, I just want to also say, as I'm sure many of you are aware, that Ireland has now recognised chronic pain as a medical speciality in its own right. And before I came here today, I spoke to a, a man called Dr. Liam Conroy. Some of you may know him. He spoke at the last event here because I've kept in contact with Liam since then. And I asked him about the impact of that because he's the specialist, he knows. And he talked about what you spoke of, about training and how important that will be. He also spoke about, um, and this comes back to the economics, about cost-benefit because they are putting in place um, care management uh, systems whereby after surgery, uh, concentrating on chronic pain as well as other areas, uh, patients can leave hospitals sooner, they can get home sooner if they have special packages put in place. So the economics of treating pain are, are also very obvious. Finally, and, um, within the parliament, um, we have, uh, if Audrey is here, Audrey Craven, I can't see her, but if she is, uh, Audrey and others have been hugely supportive in trying to set up a brain, mind, pain interest group in the Parliament, and that is going to happen after Christmas. And I think by coordinating that particular interest group with other intergroups in the Parliament, like the disability intergroup, which I'm vice president of, the mental health interest group, which I'm also involved in. And you mentioned diabetes. I'm also involved in, in a group on that. To, to look at the cross-cutting issue of pain, to raise awareness, to reduce stigmatization, which is a major issue for many people. That's not going to solve your problems today or tomorrow, but it does raise awareness and it will help members of parliament to in specific areas to look to see where they can try and affect change because now they are aware of certain things they weren't aware of before.